Good morning, everyone. Um, it's time to start. I'm going to wait another moment or so to allow uh, more people to come and attach to the session, and then we'll get going for today. Well, let's go ahead and get started for today. Um, welcome everybody to Tarrant County College South Campus's Cisco Networking Academy. Uh, this is the first uh, lecture session, online session, that we're going to use uh, for this, uh, uh, what we used to call Cisco 3. They have rearranged their courses from four to three courses. We're going to do stuff a little bit differently here at South Campus than they're doing at the Northeast and the uh, Southeast campus, but we can do that because we were the very first campus, one of the first community colleges in the area to actually start offering the Cisco Network and Academy back in 2000. I've been teaching it since that time, so 21 years for me. You guys probably are aware that about a year ago, a little over a year ago, Cisco updated the Cisco CCNA certification exam and they updated the Network Academy to represent the new objectives for that. So it's about 25% less objective material than it was before, and they rearranged the Cisco Network and Academy courses to be three instead of four. So this is the third and the fourth course, but actually it's the second and the third course of the new curriculum. And in education, everything works at a glacial pace. So we're going to wait for the state agencies, the Wickham agencies, to issue new course numbers. And um, we'll change our numbers. But in the meantime, we're still teaching under our old course numbers. So um, at the other campuses, uh, they're still offering four sequential courses. And the first course, which would normally be Introduction to uh, Fundamentals of Networking, has been re replaced by some sort of a baby Cisco course, Networking Essentials. Um, we're going to do it a little different at this campus. Uh, uh, we're going to offer the, the Cisco One course in the second eight weeks course, second eight week session, and it's going to be the full normal fundamentals of networking. So students that take that course will be totally prepared to come into this course in the spring, and then take four in the second half of the spring and get the full CCNA. So some of you I know have already taken the old what we used to call semester two routing and switching essentials. Uh, you're going to see some of this stuff is going to be a review for you. If you are new to Cisco or you've only taken some fundamentals of networking, uh, then we're going to get you caught up and uh, cover all this stuff just fine for you. Uh, stand by one second. I see some people joined. I got I have to collect attendance religiously and faithfully because we get money from Austin. Hold on. Stand by one.
Okay, so well, let's see. Everybody should be able to see the screen that says first class lecture day that I'm sharing to you. And the first thing I'm going to cover is the uh, what, we edu what the educationists, the administrators, not us faculty that actually teach stuff and do stuff, but those, those administrators that, uh, you know, there's more administrators than there are teachers. Uh, so uh, I used to be an administrator. Back in the 80s, I was a the PC repair guy I was the administrator of the PC repair program, but I have renounced the dark side. I'm no longer an administrator. Uh, um, I uh, discovered I had the heart of a teacher, and in the, you know, at the year 2000, I started teaching here back again full time. So the first thing we're going to cover is the ICR, which is how this course is structured, and then we'll take a look at the Blackboard program itself. You guys are already on Blackboard because you can collaborate, but I want to show you where all my stuff is here that we're going to use in the course. So stand by one for a second here while I go over and find the uh, ICR and make it possible for us to see it on the screen. Hold on one second. <clears throat> so I'll share, share, I'm stop sharing this application. Start sharing a window. Now let me do this. Okay, so here is the, um, I bet you thought that in order to be able to see your instructor course, oh, we've had some complaints. Students don't know where the ICR is. It's kind of hidden. It's in that blue colored course number thing on your schedule. And of course, everybody knows that in order to be able to see that, you have to log into WebAdvisor, then you have to go into the student section and then bring up your course schedule and then find your list of courses and then click on that blue ITCC number on the left and that would bring up the ICR. But uh, several years ago, the state legislature passed a, a law that all information about teachers and courses at community colleges had to be two-click accessible with no login required. So here I am at the TCC front page, no log, I'm not logged in. Well, it says I'm logged in. Okay, I'm gonna click on course and faculty. This is House Bill 2504. I'm gonna select, you can do this without locking in. I'll select the, select the current semester, 2020 fall. Uh, here's our Gonzo Secret Insider Super Tip of the Day. I'll go to, oh. All right, here we go, ITCC. This is the only screen in our entire computer system that you can see all the Cisco classes for any uh, any term, any semester that you want. And hold on, what's he saying here? Some people are joining here. being shared properly. So here's all the uh, see Cisco, Cisco courses are offered this semester. Uh, I'm teaching three of them this semester. And so we're at CCNA3. And if you click on the syllabus link here, you're not logged in. You, know, you don't have to be logged in to do this. So if you, for example, if you were a prospective student and wanted to see the syllabus or the teacher credentials, you can click on my CV and see my curriculum vita, which is like a little mini resume. And you can click on the syllabus. That's what we're going to look at for this course. So here we are. Uh, CCNA3 Scaling Networks is the old name. Um, so here's my office hours are listed here for the first eight weeks of the semester. And all the office hours are virtual because of the COVID-1984 business. Okay, there's some stuff that they put in everybody's uh, 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 syllabus, no matter what they've done. I'm going to go past the stuff to this particular for us. So um, <clears throat> there's no required bookstore text to buy for this because we're going to give you free online access to the Cisco Network and Academy material. Looks okay. All right. So the Cisco Network and Academy, netacad.com. I noticed that most of you guys have been logged in there in the past three months or so. If anybody has any problems logging to the Network and Academy um, and seeing this course, um, that's best resolved in person. So on Thursday, when we have our first, first uh, in person, face to face lab, 
in the uh, here in the uh, South Campus uh, uh, SBUS South Business 1125 network uh, Cisco laboratory. Uh, we can resolve all that stuff. Guys, I can use seat codes and stuff there and get you in uh, uh, more easily. So everybody has access to Netacad, or you'll have it soon. <clears throat> okay, so Cisco did their updates back in. Uh, 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 that's the wrong date. It was back in, in 2019. Uh, this is switching, routing, and wireless essentials. So we're going to look at some basic switching. Our first, what we're going to look at today is the basics of how an Ethernet switch works. And the first lab that we have on Thursday will be a basic lab where we hook up one host PC to a standard 24-port Ethernet switch, and we'll do some uh, uh, basic configuration of that stuff. So when we were coming to school all the time, it was a little bit different. I've changed the learn. I've changed the grading scheme slightly. All the lectures will be recorded. If you missed it or had a bad connection, you will be able to come later this afternoon. After this is over, I'll have the recording of this entire session posted under a link on Blackboard uh, called Recorded Lectures, and you'll be able to see those. So. Um, the only physical attendance really is, is coming to the laboratories. Um, work group collaboration labs and events, we'll be doing those labs. Uh, I'll attend the laboratory. I can't be with you in person for the lecture part, so we're just attending by a computer, and the lab will be in that SBS 1125 building. Uh, this course does have some chapter assessments. Um, in this particular revised curriculum, instead of being called a chapter test, they're called module exams. And instead of being one for every chapter, they have a grouping of like three or four or five modules are grouped into one particular uh, uh, assessment. We'll also have some labs, required labs, which you do in person on Thursdays. Uh, I'm not going to require any hands-on skills assessment this semester because of the attendance and the uh, uh, disease fear type problem. And But you will have to take the final exam, but you can do it from home. All the Everything's open book, all the chapter exams, all the labs. Even the final examination uh, will be open book with me. Now, now that some other guys aren't doing that, but that's the way I'm doing it. Now, local needs, I get to say. Okay, so uh, here is the grading scheme that we're going to use. Uh, all your laboratories will count for 50% of your grade. I do drop the lowest lab grade, so it's entirely possible for you to skip one lab without hurting you any. The other 50% of your grade will be just the average of all the module exams and the final exam, all weighted equally. So um, the final exam would count just like another chapter grade. And then I use like the IRS, I use NAF, I4 rounding. If you get 88.5 of your final of your final average, it'll be rounded up to a 90. If you get 79.5, it'll be rounded up to an 80. Okay, what's next? Okay, so here's the changes for for this particular semester. So we're going to be meeting at Tuesdays, every Tuesday at 9 a.m. I'll start this lecture session. I'll record it. It'll be available later if you want to review it or if you miss it for any reason. Uh, it'll be remote from wherever you are with, a, with a, uh, a computer. So log on every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. for this live session, and we'll, we'll record them later. Uh, Thursdays at 9 a.m. we'll be in person in the Cisco lab room on the South Campus SBS 1125. So on the schedule for day is um, um, Module two switching concepts, and I'm going to move that module one basic lab configuration power death by PowerPoint up to today to cover that material. So um, it's not going to be five hours. Uh, we'll get, get done sooner than that. Uh, Thursday will be our first lab orientation day, and we'll do lab 1.1.7. And I'll get you guys who've never been here before, who've never seen our physical lab set up in our room, uh, how the physical lab is set up, how it works. And uh, I'll go through lab 117 on the screen and then let you turn you guys loose to do it for yourself. <clears throat> and then so through the rest of the semester, then basically every Tuesday is going to be a, uh, a lecture session. And every uh, Thursday will be a lab session. And then our final exam will be, looks like it's going to be October the 15th, the final exam, although the deans have asked us to turn on the final exam for about a week beforehand. So I would probably turn on the final exam more like sometime on Thursday, October the 8th, I'll probably turn on the final exam, and you'll need to finish it by about 11.30 a.m. just before noon on Thursday, the October the 15th. And you guys that are coming back for CCNA 4, that class will start the week after uh, the final exam for this course. 
that class will start on Tuesday, October the 20th. Okay, I think I've shown the ICR stuff. Now I need to show, stop sharing that. And I need to show the um, standby one. Also, the next thing we're going to cover is the, what the student sees for Blackboard. Okay, good. So I will go and share, stop sharing, share, application window. Let's see, Let me this one. Here we go. So this is a student view for Blackboard. This is what you see. Uh, the teachers see a similar screen. It's got some extra stuff in, like you know, putting in group grades. I can't let you put in your grades. So this is what you get. So <clears throat> this is recapping what we did here, and then the capstone course will start uh, in October the twentieth. Um, so what I'm going to cover today is I'm going to. Everybody is in this Blackboard meeting tool right now. That's the online meeting tool. Uh, a little bit later today, I'm going to pop up a new link on here. There will be recorded lecture sessions. Uh, this session is being recorded, and I'll pop it up there and uh, put it where you guys can see it. There are some study guides that sort of line up with the older curriculum. Uh, they have some stuff in here that, that uh, we don't cover anymore. For example, the EIGRP uh, routing protocol, the Cisco proprietary routing protocol, is no longer part of CCNA. It's just the regular OSPF, which is an open standard routing protocol that uh, everybody supports. The student lab printouts shows um, all the labs that we'll be doing, and we'll be doing this one next time. So this is a simple Microsoft Word document. And the way I'll have you guys do the labs is uh, when you come in and do the labs, uh, you can print that out on the printer in the room and hand in the piece of paper to me. <clears throat> if you want to do the lab remotely you know, when using um, uh, Packet Tracer, you can just save that Microsoft Word file and add your name to it, and you can email it to me. What we're going to cover today is uh, we're going to cover, um, I'm going to do the module two first, which is some, a, a very short PowerPoint presentation on, on Ethernet switching concepts. And then I'm going to cover, a, it's a longer PowerPoint presentation on basic configuration. Maybe some of it review. If you've ever taken the Cisco course before, you've seen all this stuff. And we'll look at the configuration topic, topic commands that we'll be doing uh, in the lab that we're doing on Thursday. Now let's see, what else am I supposed to show you here? Um, later on in the semester, oops, I should have done that. Can I do this? Okay. Uh, the course evaluation, they're going to ask you later in the semester to complete a course evaluation. You can either do that in a web advisor, you can click here. Um, this is a, like a, cust a customer satisfaction survey. And when you click on my grades, you'll see uh, now. Oh, let me tell you about the grades. This is a gotcha. This is a weird thing. Um, we use two LMSs, learning management systems. We're required to use Blackboard right now. <clears throat> and we also have to use the Cisco Networking Academy because that's where your online ebook is. And that's where all the exams are going to be uh, for this particular course. So, the grades that appear on the Cisco Networking Academy, there's a place on there where you, where you can look at your grades. It's totally bogus. Pay no attention to it. The only grades that matter are the ones that I punch into Blackboard. That's going to be the 50% uh, will be your labs. Those will start showing up through the semester as you can pick your labs. And then the other 50% that comes from the online tests you take on the Cisco Networking Academy will not appear on Blackboard until toward the end of the semester where I punch those in because we're required to. Use Blackboard to compute your final grade. Okay, let's see. I think I finished with that. And uh, I'm going to cover the Cisco Networking Academy stuff a little bit on Thursday when we're all in, mostly all in person, and we'll be able to see, uh, uh, resolve any problems and uh, uh, things of that nature. Oh, I've seen more people here. Stand by one second while I. Uh, uh,
Okay, good. It looks like everybody's here, about two people. Good attendance. Good, good job, guys. So uh, I thought I clicked the permissions thing where you guys are permitted to use your camera, but I can't see any of you guys, but that's okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to put my little picture away, and I'm going to bring up the first PowerPoint presentation that we're going to cover today. Oh, oh, I've got to add the files. Oh, oh dear. It's got to process the files now. Okay, go to my desktop. Oh, oh dear, oh dear. I've got to download the file. Stand by one second, guys. I'll fix this up for you. Just hang loose for a second. <coughs> <coughs> Oops. Okay, um, I um, have to click a button in Blackboard to tell it to add a PowerPoint file, and it takes a second to process a PowerPoint file. It's converting it right now. So uh, we're waiting, we're watching, and that'll pop up in a second. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about, I can talk about this for a second while I'm waiting for the slide, is um, uh, Ethernet switching. You know, Ethernet switches are layer two devices, they're data link layer devices, they're a LAN device that you normally attach to, uh, uh, you put in a room, you put in a, a wiring closet somewhere in the room. You gonna let me come up here? He's still covering you, okay. Okay, I'll click share now. There we go, there's our, there's our splash slide, okay. <coughs> So we're going to look at what layer two switches do when they forward data. And um, so Ethernet switches basically can do three different things. They can actually take a frame and move it somewhere, or, or they can be lazy and decide they don't have to do anything with it. We call that filtering, forwarding, and flooding. So what happens with an Ethernet switch is your PC is plugged into port number one, and you send out a ping request to a server that's plugged into port number two. And the Ethernet switch receives that ping request, which is going to be encapsulated in an Ethernet frame. And he's going to decide, he needs to decide, should I forward this frame? Or should I flood this frame to all the other ports? Or should I not have to do anything with it? So he's going to, the switch is going to forward it to, he's probably has already learned the MAC address of the server that's in port number two. He's going to look in this switching, this MAC address table, this content addressable memory table, and he's going to see that that uh, server's identity, his, his dead link layer address is in port number two, and he'll simply forward that. The switches operate much lot nicer, more nicely, more efficiently than the old hubs did, because the old hubs would simply flood everything to everywhere. They had no, uh, they had no intelligence in their memory. 
The switches are like little computers. They have CPU, RAM, ROM. They have an operating system, the iOS operating system. And they're able to make more intelligent decisions. And that frees up more bandwidth for the users that your company are concerned. Sometimes we need to flood the Ethernet frame that we sent into that port to all of the other ports on the switch. Uh, for example, in the case of a broadcast. Um, uh, if we send a broadcast request out, for, if a workstation does an ARP request, that's in the form of a broadcast. You're saying, calling all stations. I need to learn another PC's MAC address, and I only know his IP address. So I'm going to send out a broadcast request that goes something like this. Calling all stations. If your IP address is 1.1.1.1, .1 .1 .1, If your IP address is 1.1.1.1, .1 .1 .1, um, please respond to me and tell me what your MAC address is. And it has to be broadcast to everybody because we don't know what port number the 1.1.1.1 server is plugged into. Then he responds and then he updates his table and everything's cool. Uh, also, if a PC sends a frame into an, uh, to an Ethernet switch and he has not yet learned the server's destination MAC address, he'll have to wait for the server to respond one time and then he'll update it. And that has to be flooded too. So all broadcasts and all unknown unicasts are flooded to all the other ports. Once the addresses have been learned, um, they simply forward them efficiently from one port to the other. And all the other ports hear no traffic, and they're free. Their bandwidth is free for other things. Now, if we did something silly like uh, put a hub in an office and plug two devices into it, they're already connected via the hub. And that third wire on the hub that goes back to the switch that's in the wiring closet in the middle of the building, He'll hear these two guys, he'll hear these two devices, he already learned that they're on the same port and he doesn't need to pour that information. So he'll simply uh, filter, he won't do anything with it. So that's the three things that Ethernet switches do. They filter, they forward, and they flood. <clears throat> okay, looking at a little six port Ethernet switch here. Uh, we're using some technical terms here. Ingress is any data that goes into the interface and egress is any data that comes out through the interface. So here's how the switch makes this forward and decision. Let's say your uh, device, your desktop PC is plugged into port number one and your MAC address is, is EE. Now, it, well, yes, it's really 12 hex digits. It's really 48 binary bits. But we're using a little abbreviated thing here just to make it easier on your eyes. So if the host machine, your desktop PC that's plugged into port number one with a MAC address of EE, sends an uh, information to the server, which has a MAC address of AA that's plugged into port number two. Well, it looks as if this port table chart, this MAC address table, he's already learned that. So he will gracefully forward that Ethernet frame to port number two, and the other guys on ports three, four, five, and six won't hear anything. So switches use their MAC address table to make the forwarding decision. Should I filter, should I forward, or should I flood? Now, if you think about the little bits of electricity that make up an ethernet frame that flowed into that port number one, it's already at port number one. So it doesn't forward it back at the same interface it came into, it was already there. Okay, this is like if you turn, if you tell a, if you tell a rumor to your neighbor, your neighbor doesn't turn around and tell the rumor back to you. He turns around and tells it to his neighbor. So once he's already heard the bits, he doesn't need to receive them again. That would be duplicate information. <clears throat> so switches use their MAC address table to, uh, they take a look at that destination MAC address. So what did they do with the source MAC address? When you send your Ethernet frame into your switch, he learns your source MAC address. And now he knows if someone sends you an answer back, that's, he knows which physical port location you're plugged into. He'll send it to you. So before the switch can make that decision to learn what interface the destination is located, uh, if he doesn't learn it, he's going to have to flood it to all the other ports. So this MAC address table is sometimes called a content address memory table or CAM table. Um, the MAC address table, CAM table, just another, another term for exactly the same thing. So any Ethernet frame that flows into any switch port will be memorized by that Ethernet switch's MAC table, the MAC address table, the CAM table. He'll record that source address. And now when you get your answer back, he knows, I joke, he knows who you are and where you live. He'll be able to send that back to you. So the two things that the switches do, we used to call them, before they were called switches, they were called bridges. Uh, we called them learning bridges. 
because anytime anybody sent an Ethernet frame into a port of a bridge, what we now call a switch, he would learn your MAC address and he would memorize it. So if you send an Ethernet frame into a switch, he will learn your address. If it was already learned, he will simply reset it back. And he doesn't hold on to it for, for about, about five minutes because you could unplug something and move it to another port. So step one is whenever the switch receives an Ethernet frame, he learns or relearns the source, the source MAC address of the device that created that Ethernet frame. Of course, encapsulated in this Ethernet frame is probably an IP packet or a ping request, something of that sort. Step two is look at the destination MAC address that you were trying to talk to and see if that's in the MAC address table. If it's present, he will simply uh, forward it out that port very efficiently. If it's not, it's an unknown unicast. It's flooded out all interfaces, except, of course, the, can, the one it came in on. And we're not going to see this. <laughs> OK, switches do this very quickly because they use some custom chips, some custom uh, silicon. They're called application-specific integrated circuits. Uh, they can do this processing very quickly in silicon than, rather than doing it slowly in the software of a CPU. Uh, switches can use a couple of different methods. Uh, and the first method's default for Cisco. Uh, they used to use cut through, but they changed their mind. So store and forward means read in, read in the entire Ethernet frame. Make sure the frame is OK. How do we know the Ethernet frame is OK? Remember, guys? Oh, yeah, there's a frame check sequence at the end of the frame. The source machine creates the Ethernet frame. He encapsulates separate layer information into it. And he creates a 32-bit checksum or check code, a cyclic redundancy checksum. And he puts that on the end of the frame and transmits the whole frame. And if there's any errors on the wire due to electrical interference or any problem, when the receiving workstation receives the data, he recalculates that 32-bit checksum, that uh, frame check sequence. And if it matches, he knows the data is OK, and he'll accept it. If it doesn't match, he'll simply drop it, pretend it was never there. So in a store and forward switch, the receiving port will receive the entire Ethernet frame and make sure it's OK. And then he'll go through this process of forwarding, filtering, or flooding, depending on what was in the MAC address table. Uh, cut through switching is a method that um, allows you to forward the frame more quickly. Uh, it turns out that Ethernet frames have the destination MAC address as the very first part of the frame. And that's the one thing the switch needs to make a forwarding decision. So he can actually start forwarding the frame before the entire frame has arrived. The danger is if it turns out to be a bad frame, he's carefully forwarding garbage. So Cisco used to program all their switches for cut through switching and they claimed low latency. They changed their mind about 10 years ago and decided that they're gonna do store and forward because they can claim that they have fewer errors. Okay, so store and forward is gonna read the entire frame. There at the end is our frame check sequence, the CRC. And um, the port is gonna receive a frame. He's gonna recalculate the CRC. It should match what the source machine that transmitted it set, put in there. And um, then he will uh, go ahead and forward the frame if it's a good frame. Bad frames will just be dropped. Uh, there are special types of memory present in Ethernet switches to save or buffer incoming information. So for example, if 20 people are trying to log into the server in the morning and log in, uh, the server, uh, if it didn't have enough memory chips, it would drop people's login requests. So the buffer memory uh, allows uh, information to be stored and sent out uh, uh, whenever it's ready. This also takes care of the problem. What if you're a fast Ethernet 100 megabit workstation and the server's one, megabit, uh, one gigabit? or maybe more common these days, you're gigabit attached and the server's 10 gigabit. Well, we have to put it in a memory chip and then shoot it out to the server at 10 times speed and then dribble back that answer back to you at the slow gigabit speed. So buffer memory takes care of that problem. So store and forward, very reliable, out of the box. This is how Cisco switches are done. Uh, cut through says, well, let's look at that first header of the frame. And that's the thing that has the destination MAC addresses first. So as soon as the destination MAC address is received, that little purple destination MAC address in the bottom left-hand corner of your, of your screen, he can go and start forwarding the data. Uh, he hasn't received the checksum yet. He doesn't know if this data is good. So he might, he could, he could send garbage. 
So uh, cut through can either do it very aggressively, very quickly, or that you can make it sort of a centrist, a middleman type thing, fragment free. They wait for 64 bytes of the into Ethernet frame, not bits, but bytes. Um, it turns out that if there's going to be Ethernet frames that have errors, almost 99% of them are, we will determine that in the first 64 bytes, so we can drop them. So cut through switching is okay if we need to reduce latency. Uh, it can propagate errors, uh, can have bandwidth issues. Um, if the ports are different speeds, you can't use it. So if you're gigabit attached from your employee workstation and the server is 10 gigabit attached, can't work. It's got buffer memory. Cut through, fragment free can only work if both devices have the same speed. Now, collision domains with the old hubs. All the devices are plugged into the old hubs. No one should use any hubs for any reason today. Um, you might find an application for them in installing Microsoft domain controllers or, or security stuff where you want to snoop on a wire and see what's going on. But normally, we don't want to use hubs because they they are, are allow devices to collide with each other and they reduce bandwidth. And it's only half duplex; only one device can talk at a time. Whereas with a switch, all devices can talk at the same time and they're all full, du full duplex, and everybody gets better performance. So switches eliminate these collision domains. Uh, now, if I put a hub in my office and plugged in a printer and a couple of PCs on it, I would the hub, the devices, the two PCs and the printer could collide with each other in my office. And of course, IT would know because they'd start seeing collisions on my port. And you know, we had to sign a, a use agreement that says, no, I'm not going to. Uh, Add any devices to the network because they could degrade the performance of the network and they'd know to come and get me. So with half duplex devices, we can't have collisions. Um, most industry devices use auto negotiation to try to get both devices on the uh, on both ends of a wire to be the fastest possible speed and the fastest duplex. We want full duplex and the fastest possible speed. If you bring in your old Hewlett Packard laptop from 20 years ago it's probably half duplex 10 megabit the switch will negotiate down to that speed so they can communicate okay now we're not going to have to worry about collision domains because we have subs anymore and we're not going to uh, maybe in some public school environments they might have a switch in the wiring closet in the hall and then they might use a hub in the classroom to connect a bunch of devices together with uh, mostly what hubs have been done away with these days. Uh, let's talk about broadcast domains now. So talking about the default behavior of a switch, what information gets flooded to out all the other ports? Well, the first one we talked about was unknown unicast. I send something from my PC into my port of the switch, and he doesn't have the destination address in his MAC address table, so he floods it to all the other ports in an attempt to get it to the guy that needs to get it. If I send a broadcast message, for example, the routing protocol broadcasts its routing table to its neighbors. You guys remember that from the that's the routing and switching essentials. If I send an ARP request, that's in the form of a broadcast. I don't know the guy's MAC address. I'm asking for it. So I have to put out a broadcast message that says, if you have this IP address, tell me what your MAC address is so I can stop doing these noisy broadcasts. So broadcast, whenever a switch encounters a broadcast, he is compelled to flood this to all the other ports. So in the bottom half of the diagram, we have two switches, S1 and S2, connected together. So if any one of these workstations issues a broadcast, everybody will hear this. Everyone in a broadcast domain can hear everybody else's broadcasts. So we don't want our broadcast domains to be too big. Oh, 100, 200 workstations in one broadcast domain, you're hitting the upper limit. You're going to decrease performance. So if we don't, if we want to reduce the size of our broadcast domains, we'll introduce a router into it. Routers don't forward broadcast. Routers filter broadcast. Okay, so let's use their MAC address table and this full duplex mechanism, which is sending and receiving at the same time. Oh, let me explain full duplex again. Half duplex is like a CB radio. When I hold the push the button, talk button on the CB radio down, I can't hear you. You can't interrupt me. I have to let go before I can hear you. So hubs were like that. Old, old NIC cards were half duplex. 
A uh, full duplex is like a telephone. I can talk to you on the telephone and you can, I can hear you while I'm talking. You can say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You can interrupt me. So uh, MAC address tables, full duplex communication. We should eliminate all collisions and reduce network congestion. So uh, modern uh, ethernet switches have fast port speeds. Uh, gigabit ethernet is pretty common today in both residential and commercial applications. Uh, some servers may be attached at 100 gigabit speeds. Uh, very fast circuitry on the inside of the device, so you can have good performance. Large buffers, these are our, our memory chips that uh, temporarily storage the, uh, the frame so it can be handled in time. And high port density is a fe feature that uh, means you can have more ports in a small physical space. So you can have, uh, oh, for example, the switches we use in the lab are 24 port switches, and they take one rack mount unit. The switches in our wiring closet and the hall of the business building have 48 ports in that same amount of space because that switching closet is only about as big as a bathroom stall, and there's just no room in there for a bunch of 24 port switches. So they use high port density 48 port switches. Okay, I'm going to cut this now, and we're going to jump to... Uh, basic configuration. I'm backwards, I did two and now I'll do one. You guys that have taken any Cisco course ever is gonna, are gonna recognize uh, some of this configuration stuff. Okay, let's talk about, before we talk about how Switch boots up, let's review when a desktop PC boots up, what does it do? You know, stumble on desktop, we have Dell PCs in our, in our facility. Any desktop PC, doesn't matter who makes it. First of all, the PC boots up, he does a power on subtest. He's checking the PC to make sure there's no shorts between the wires or you haven't added a new device or anything like that. And uh, when he finished, sometimes on some computers you'll see him counting up the RAM chips and up in the upper left hand corner of the screen. Uh, uh, next of all, the desktop PC is gonna look in his ROM BIOS setup program and say, what should I boot up first? Now, almost all the time, that's the built-in hard disk drive. Uh, but maybe you have configured it maybe to boot from a CD-ROM drive. Or maybe you plugged in a USB and you're going to try Linux or something. So uh, he'll check with his bootloader software and see you know, what he's supposed to run. Uh, most of the time, he's going to uh, load the Windows operating system off the hard disk drive that's present in that computer. So the hard disk drive boots up, he loads the Windows files, Windows initializes his file system, and then you're presented with probably a login prompt or maybe your computer automatically logs in and you can start working on your computer. Windows boots up all his files and then Windows has something in it called the Windows registry. And so it sets your desktop background to the what your preferences were. He puts all your icons on the screen the way you arrange them because that can be personalized for each user different from another user. So Cisco switches are similar electronic architecture to a desktop PC. They've got a CPU chip, they've got RAM, they've got ROM. Um, instead of a hard disk drive, they have a flash drive because flash drives are more reliable than hard disk spinning drives, spinning rust. They don't have keyboard ports and video ports. Instead, we're gonna use a TerraTerm type terminal program to connect them from a, another device that does have a screen and a keyboard. So when the switch boots up, or for a router too, this is also applies to a router, they do the power on self-test. This is stored in the ROM memory. Uh, it checks the hardware check, make sure everything's okay. Uh, next, the switch is gonna load uh, from the uh, uh, ROM chip. He's gonna load the bootloader software that allows it to go, go and find the flash memory and load it up. So he's going to uh, uh, initialize the CPU and uh, load the file system for the flash drive and load the iOS operating system. Well, it's not Windows, it's iOS. It doesn't have graphical user stuff. It's, it's been uh, optimized for switching purposes and it doesn't need all that GUI junk. And finally, the switch will either uh, uh, ask you to put in your password or if it's an unconfigured switch, you'll be dumped at the user exec mode and you can start setting up the switch. Now, normally, the switch is gonna boot the iOS file that's present in the file system. There's gonna be just one. It is possible to uh, dual boot these devices. 
So uh, if you want to, if, for example, maybe you have a switch with an iOS in it and the vendor, I, uh, Cisco has released a new iOS with a bug fix or a feature upgrade that you need, and you want to try that out, but it's a production environment and you, don't, you want the ability to roll back to the original iOS that was working okay. So you can copy the new iOS to the switch and you can use the boot system command to say, don't boot off the first one that was there, the old one, boot off the second one. So you use this command that's in black here, boot system flash, he gives the name of the new iOS he wants to try. So the next time the switch boots up, he'll use that new iOS. If it doesn't work or you don't like it, you can replace the boot system with the old iOS and get back to the way you were. So you always want the ability to, when you, whenever you're in, in IT and you want to make a change, change, there's always a possibility that it won't work out. You want to be able to roll back to, to your previous configuration because your users are going to be coming in in the morning and they need to use it. At the front of the switch, there's some lights here. A system LED uh, shows uh, uh, that it's on. Uh, when you first turn it on, it's flashing. The system LED will be flashing to show you that it's loading the system. If it never stops flashing, there's an error. Oh, bummer. Uh, redundant power supply is a battery that you can hook to switches so that if the commercial power, AC power fails, the backup battery power will think of it like a UPS for a server. If you have those plugged in, that'll be lit up. Uh, the port status light, stat, uh, it'll show you green when something's plugged in. We'll talk about later about why when you plug in a wire, it turns orange for 50 seconds and then finally turns green. Uh, the port duplex light will show you uh, if it's, you know, st standard 10 megabit, uh, uh, 100 bit fast ethernet, uh, gigabit ethernet speeds. Uh, our our speeds are, uh, our speeds in our system are all the 24 main ports are, are fast Ethernet 100 gigabit, and then there are two uplink ports that are gigabit Ethernet speed. And the duplex link indicates it's full duplex. It should always be full duplex. Uh, power over Ethernet is something that's used with surveillance cameras and Wi-Fi access points and Cisco IP telephones that sends the power to the device so you don't have to plug in a wall warp transformer to it. If uh, the switch is equipped with this, it'll be lit. Uh, the switches we have in the Cisco lab do not have power over Ethernet on them. In the commercial world, you would probably use power over Ethernet because you're probably using a voice over IP telephone systems or surveillance cameras. The mode button is used to move between these various modes, and we will use this later when we do password recovery on a switch. If someone has forgotten the password and they need to get into the switch and reset the password, uh, you have to hold the mode button down while performing some magic to be able to recover that. Okay, so this chart, I'll let you guys look at this. It's just all the various combinations of stuff, but let's get going here. Okay, so here's the uh, password recovery thing. And I'll demonstrate these use guys in the lab sometime. Um, if the system crashes because the flash file has gone bad or more commonly someone has forgotten their password, uh, you can connect the console cable PC to a console cable to the console port. And switches don't have switches. In other words, there's no switch on them. Why? Because someone would turn them off. So no switches. It's always on. The only way to turn it off is to pull the cord loose. So you unplug the power cord and plug the power cord back in and hold the mode button down while you plug it in. And wait. It takes about 20 seconds and your finger will get sore until the system LED turns amber and green, and then you can let go, and then you can go back in and you can fix the iOS that got clobbered, or you can go in and reset the password, stuff like that. I'll illustrate that to you guys in person when we have a lab. Okay, let's set up our switch. Now, keep in mind that probably 75% of these Cisco Ethernet switches that ship into industry are never configured. They just go to a small business and they buy one or two of them. If they have two, they jump with them together and they plug their users and devices into them and they use them. They don't have any configuration at all. They don't have host names, they don't have IP addresses. But we're gonna, uh, CCNA objective is be able to manage a switch. We're gonna apply an IP address to it and, and uh, set passwords on it so people can't jack around with it, things of that nature. So the first thing we wanna do is, is configure it with an IP address and a subnet pass. Um, now, if you are configuring your switch from a, from a remote Device, PC, PC1 is directly attached to Switch S1. Um, but if it's another PC somewhere else on the network, on the other side of that R1 router, um, 
the switch needs a default gateway, just like your PC one needs a default gateway to talk to people that are not, not on his individual local area network on his subnet. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna to configure the switch virtual interface, the SVI. We're gonna configure that with an IP address, and we'll see the code for doing that in a little bit. So we have to do this from a console cable because um, uh, there's no way to configure a switch if it doesn't have an initial configuration. We have to use the console cable to do this. Okay, uh, VLAN, we're gonna cover VLANs in a later chapter, virtual LANs, but all switches are configured where all the ports are connected together nor normally because when 75% of them go into small businesses and they're never gonna be configured for different networks, we want them to all be able to talk to each other. So VLAN one is the default VLAN for all Cisco switches. And uh, the VLANs are where we're gonna apply, this is gonna be our virtual interface that we're gonna apply an IP address to. Um, we're going to apply a uh, IP version 4 address and a subnet mask. Um, and he says that the a VLAN won't come up and up until you create it, do a no shutdown on it, and there's some device plugged into some port that's associated, uh, assigned to VLAN 99. Uh, here's a gotcha for IP version 6. Now, all our switches that are in the lab support IP version 6. You have to run this command first, SDM prefer dual to make it support IP version six addresses. The switch that's in the Cisco packet tracer has the old version 12 iOS, which does not support any kind of IP version six. You can't run this command. Well, in our very first lab we're doing on Thursday, we're gonna be assigning IP version six addresses to the switch. So there's a procedure in Packet Tracer where you can attach a server to it and you can load a newer iOS into that switch where you can do that. Nothing complicated about that. Okay, so here are the exact commands to do this. Uh, uh, someone has previously configured this switch to have a host name of S1, with the host name S1 command. And it says S1 pound sign. As to review, that's the uh, privilege exec mode. And we're going to tap the command configure terminal to go into the configuration mode. And in the second line, the prompt has changed to S1 config. So now we're going to specify interface VLAN 99. The prompt changes to config IF. And we're going to put in the IP address, whatever the appropriate IP address is for that particular switch, a management address. He's also applying an IP version 6 address to it. So we see our IP version 6 address. Uh, with the colons instead of the periods. And then that command, no shutdown, is very important because it was like with real physical Cisco devices, if you don't do a no shutdown command, it's administratively shut down and you won't be able to use it. Then he goes into the last line, he does the copy run start command. Anytime you perform any type of configuration on the Cisco router switch, you should periodically perform the copy run start command to back it up. That copies the configuration to the NVRAM and so if it's turned off and on again, you won't have to reconfigure the whole switch. So Hicks rule of backing up as often as you care or as seldom as you dare. It's like when you're doing a Word document, how often do you want to save it? You know, every paragraph, every five minutes, something like that. Okay, here's an example of how to configure the default gateway command. Uh, be in the global configuration mode. So in line one, he's gone, he's typed the configuration, configure terminal, config T for short. The prompt changes to config. And he issues the command IP default gateway 172.17.99.1. And uh, now that device is present. Uh, okay, guys, stand by one second. I'm going to check. I'm going to check attendance. Stand by one second. Okay, so we uh, did the IP, IP default command and he did a copy run start again to save the configuration. Good practice. You can do it as often as you want to. Okay, like Reagan said, trust but verify. So we're gonna check the configuration and make sure that we didn't fat finger any of the numbers or we forgot to type no shutdown or anything like that. So in step three here, he's typed show IP interface brief. 
And it shows us that we did, in fact, assign that IP address, that 172 address to the VLAN 99. And we did do the no shutdown command because otherwise the status would say administratively down. It's down and down right now because no one has plugged a, a desktop PC into any port. As soon as I do that, it'll come up and up. Now, a weird thing about the switches is when you do show IP interface brief, it only shows you the IP version 4 address. If you want to see the IP version 6 address, you type to have to type show IP v6 interface brief, and there we can see uh, the uh, IPv6 address that was applied to that. That's the 2001, the globally unique address, and the FE80, which is the link local address. OK, duplex communication is what we want because it's more efficient. Both ends can send and receive simultaneously. When you were using that push to talk microphone with a CB radio, I couldn't interrupt you. I had to wait. Um, so bi-directional communication, micro segmentation to the desktop means that every device is plugged into a dedicated switch port. No hubs, no sharing. So there's no collisions possible when you're the only device. You'll never have a collision. If I break the rules and put a hub in my office and plug three devices into it, I could have collisions. So half duplex communication, one at a time. Only one person can transmit. I can find transmitting, I can't hear. So all the Ethernet speeds that were faster than full Ethernet, than fast Ethernet, are full duplex by definition. There's no such thing as a half duplex gigabit Ethernet. There were a few rare fast Ethernet hubs. I used one once. But almost everything you see today that's fast Ethernet is going gonna, gonna to be full duplex. So this is much, uh, much more efficient, better bandwidth use. Now, the switch ports will. Uh, the hardware has gotten much better. 10 or 15 years ago, we would have problems when we plugged a couple of switches together, and they would one would decide to be half duplex and one would decide to be full duplex, and there would be lots of late collisions. Uh, the hardware has gotten much better now. You can usually plug any device to any other device, and auto MDIX and the uh, negotiation process will automatically take care of the fastest possible speed in common between the two devices. You can change them if you want to. If you run into a couple of those Cisco switches and one's half duplex and one's full duplex, you can go to the one switch and you can issue the command duplex half or duplex full and make sure they match so they won't have a, a bunch of errors. So by default, everything is auto. Our switches are Cisco Catalyst 2960s that we use in the lab. Um, so they can only be half duplex when they're 10 or 100 megabit, and when they're one gigabit or above, they can only be full duplex. The auto negotiation will normally take care of this for you. So if you have a problem, you can always type the show interfaces command on both switches and make sure uh, uh, that everything is okay. Oh, how about fiber optics? Fiber optics are always full duplex. There is always two fiber elements with fiber optics, one per transmit, one per receive. So let's say we have two switches connected to each other. And we want to check to make sure, in this case, the fast Ethernet 0 slash 1 port of S1 is connected to the corresponding fast Ethernet 0 slash 1 of switch S2. And we want to make sure that they're full duplex. We're going to manually configure it. Now, when you do this stuff in the lab, you won't have to do this because they're going to just automatically find the highest possible speed for you. But if you wanted to do this manually, you could go to the switch 1, issue the command interface fast Ethernet 0 slash 1 and type the command duplex full and speed 100 to manually set those to those parameters. And then at the end, of course, you should do a copy run start to save the configuration. OK, auto MDIX is a feature that uh, you probably slept since then. But in, in the earlier Cisco class, we talked about the three cable types that you're supposed to know for Cisco CCNA, straight through cables, which most cables are uh, crossover or cross-connect cables, which we used to have to use uh, between uh, uh, identical devices, and then the console cable, which is that baby blue rollover cable. So it used to be that if you connected, for example, when I got a cable modem service uh, for the first time, uh, they had to plug a crossover cable between the cable modem and my PC so they could communicate with each other. There was no auto MDX back then. But what auto MDX does is, if you plug a straight through cable when it should have been a crossover cable, or you plug in a crossover cable when it should have been a straight through cable, the transistors and the logic in that device automatically gussy up your connection for you and make it right. So you can use 
straight through almost all the time we can use straight. We used to have to use crossover cables with our older routers in the lab because they weren't auto NDIX. Well, our new routers that we got a couple years ago, everything's auto NDIX. All the switch ports, all the router ports are auto NDIX. So we don't have to use any crossover cables. So on the switches, you can use the MDX auto command to turn this on. If you want to turn it off for some reason, you can. We used to use a model Cisco 2950 switch in the lab. Uh, about eight, nine years ago, we replaced those with 2960s. The 2950s were not auto MDIX. We had to use crossover cables to go back and forth between them. And you can always check this out with the show controller command to see what the status is of your particular switch. Shouldn't be much of a problem with the modern devices that we use now. So some switch verification commands. I'm going to type show interfaces. It's going to show me all the interfaces on my device, whether they're up, up and up. If it's a router, it'll show the IP addresses. Um, if I want to show the starting startup configuration or the running configuration, I can type show run or show start and check that. If I want to type show flash, that'll show me the files on the flash system. You'll see, for example, the iOS file. Um, show version will show us the version of the operating system. It'll show us what feature packs have been installed on the device. Uh, it'll show us the configuration register, which on routers we use to recover the password with. There's a command history. We can show history. You can type a command, and instead of typing it again, you can type the up arrow key on your keyboard, and you can repeat that command. Um, to show IP information, we can type show IP interface or show IPv6 interface, which usually type, we usually type show IP interface brief, so it's not so many pages. I can look at the MAC addresses of the devices, show a MAC address table, and he takes uh, with, a, with or without a dash between the MAC and the address, he takes either one. Okay, so show run shows us the exact configuration that's in RAM right now. The running configuration is in RAM. I can configure a device and all the commands I type, like the host name and the passwords are stored in RAM. I haven't saved it yet. It's not an NVRAM, it hasn't been saved yet. It's like a Microsoft Word document. You have not yet saved to the hard drive. So this shows us, for example, that the fast Ethernet port is uh, 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 set to 172.17.99.11, has a default gateway set, and we can see some information about that particular uh, interface. So show interfaces shows us that the particular port 18, it's up and up. Now, on Cisco routers, all the ports are down by default. They're administratively down until you do a no shutdown. On Cisco switches, the, the uh, VLAN management ports are down by default. You have to do a no shutdown on those. But remember that 75% of these Cisco switches ship into industry and are never configured. So the ports will come up and up connected all by themselves without you having to type the no shutdown command on a switch. You'll still have to do a no shutdown on the VLAN if you want to manage it. You'll still have to type in no shutdown on all the router ports when we get to the router. And this tells us, for example, it tells us the MAC address of this particular port. It tells us that it's connected at the fast Ethernet speed. And it uh, hasn't, been, hasn't had a bunch of errors. It's running at full duplex. If we're having issues, the show interfaces command is a great troubleshooting tool to look for, for problems. So if there are errors, we'll see the errors are existing. If, uh, if it says something like interface is up, line protocol is down, oh, there could be an encapsulation mismatch with the other end, the other end could be error disabled, could be some type of hardware problem. If they're down and down, if you show interfaces on a port that has no wire plug to it, it's gonna stay down and down. Not administratively down, it's ready to go. You just have to plug a wire into it, get the link line to line up. I can disable this port 18 if I wanted to, I could type no shut, I could type shutdown on it and it would turn off. And uh, no data would transmit through it. And then I could do a no shutdown and bring it back up again. Later on when we look at port security, we're gonna use that trick to, if there's a security error on a port, we're gonna type the shutdown command to totally disable it. And then we're gonna type the no shutdown command to reset the error and bring it back into operation. So show interfaces shows us a bunch of information there. You see that orange stuff at the bottom? If there's a bunch of numbers there, big numbers, you're having, you're having some type of physical wiring here. So in this case, we've got some late collisions. We've got a bunch of collisions. They're not supposed to be collisions on switches. 
Well, uh, this is an indication for a good example. This type of numbers indicate that uh, uh, the switch at the other end doesn't match the duplex setting on the switch on this end. This one's full duplex, the other one's half duplex. So we're getting some errors. That gives a, a clue that we need to go to the other switch and, and manually adjust these parameters so they match. So we get a total number of errors. Uh, a runt is a special is, is a special name for an Ethernet packet that's Ethernet frames are supposed to be at least 64 bytes and no bigger than 1518 bytes or octets. If they're smaller than 64 bytes, they're probably a collision fragment. We'll call that a runt. Uh, giants are packets that are bigger than 1518 bytes. So any upper layer data that's bigger than that has to be divided up into a bunch of Ethernet frames. If the cyclic redundancy checksum test fails, uh, it will be dropped. The switch will keep a track on it. Um, output error shows all the errors. And if there's any collisions or late collisions, that's a good thing to check for duplex, half duplex, full duplex mismatch errors, or maybe bad blocking errors. So Ethernet frames that are shorter than the 64 byte, they're called runts. Uh, it can be caused by collisions. It could be caused by a network interface card and NIC that uh, has some type of hardware failure. Uh, giants are larger, and then CRC errors usually indicate there's some sort of cable error. Collisions in half duplex operations, that's normal. If we have a half duplex hubs, we're going to get collisions. We have a method of recovering from the collisions. Um, but on a full duplex line, you should never see any collisions. Um, duplex misconfiguration or cables too long can be a cause of late collisions. So troubleshooting. Oh, yeah, the new objectives, there's almost no troubleshooting, but we're going to go a little bit here. So here we have a flow chart that says we're going to do a show interfaces command at the top. Is the interface up and up? Well, yeah, if it's up, we go to the yes portion and then we're going to check for electromagnetic interference or noise. We're going to make sure the duplex setting is OK on both ends. If the interface is not up, we're going to make sure that the cables are proper, make sure the connectors don't have any damage on them. Um, if the problem is solved, we yes, and we close the incident in our trouble ticketing database. If there's not a problem, we update our trouble ticket and and go back in try to use more show commands, or if it's too much for us, we'll escalate the issue to a senior engineer that has more experience. Now, I'm going to put a device on the network. I had to use my console cable to set it up first. And to do that, I had to go to where the switch was physically located and plug in the console cable. So, you know, there's physical security and there's technical security. The physical security is a switch is going to be in a locked room with a card key, something like that. No one should have access to the switches. Just walk in and use it. Um, technical security is I want to access the switch over the network. Once it's configured and on the network, I can tell that into it or secure shell into it from uh, another location. Um, I need to set passwords on it so just not anybody can do that. So we can password protect our devices. So where we can do this. Now, fact from the network fundamentals, uh, uh, Telnet protocol, port 23, totally in the clear, unencrypted. So when users enter their pass, their username admin and password CCNA, everybody can see that with a wire. For example, the Wireshark is a wire sniffing uh, protocol, sniffing program you can run and, uh, and see people's passwords on unencrypted uh, FTP, and Telnet are unencrypted, so they're kind of dangerous to use. And we used to call them hackers. Uh, we can't call them anymore because it makes them feel bad. So now we call them, then they started calling them malicious uh, intruders. No, that makes them feel bad too. So now they've been elevated to the feel-good status of a, th a threat actor. So someone that's trying to break into, if you're gonna be politically correct, you gotta call them a threat actor. So, you don't want to be clear text. In our labs, it doesn't matter. But on a real production network, you want to tighten up security. So there's another protocol that uses port 22 called Secure Shell. And this uses uh, uh, encryption keys. And everything is encrypted. And if you don't have the encryption key, you can't see the password. So if you're managing uh, your website that's on a web server farm, 
Are you managing your devices? You don't want people to mess with them, just try to guess passwords and get in there. You should use a secure shell for that. And we're going to have an example of that in the lab. So using a Wireshark trace for this, everything's, um, everything's encrypted and you can't see it. Now, some of our older switches that don't have the, uh, Cisco has a, a, the letters K9 in their, in their iOS file name. That mean, doesn't mean dogs, it means it supports the uh, encryption keys. Our old Cisco 2950 switches didn't have encryption. They didn't have the K9 in the file name. They couldn't do secure shell. But the switches we have now, they can do that. You can always check this, you can type show version and it'll tell you that the file name, in this case, the file name c 2960 landbase K9, uh, the K9 indicates that this switch does support encryption keys and you'll be able to do the secure shell. Uh, you'll be able to do the secure shell uh, sessions on it to be safe. So here's what you have to do to set up secure shell. First of all, step one, you have to man make sure that it supports secure shell. Uh, does it have K9 in the file name? You can also type the command show IPSSH. Uh, if it has secure shell, it'll tell you what version it is, two or three. If it doesn't support iOS, uh, SSH, that command will be an unrecognized command. You have to configure the IP domain. You have to use the IP domain command and just make, it doesn't have to be a real domain, cisco.com, tccd.edu, anything you want to. The way encryption works is it uses uh, encryption keys. So step three, we're going to generate a key pair. Public, you might have heard about public and private keys. The private key is one that you keep under the vest and don't tell it to anybody. The public key is the one you publish to everybody in the world. So when they send something to you, they'll encrypt it with your public key. And uh, uh, the private key, you don't tell to anybody. Um, then we're going to have a, a user. We're going to create a username and a password. We can do this locally on the machine, which we'll do in the lab. Or you can use like a AAA or a uh, type of authentication server. Uh, we won't do that because we don't have any servers in the class. Then once that step is completed, we complete, we created a username and a password. We'll configure our VTY lines. We'll say line VTY05 uh, uh, and turn on the secure shell protocol. Um, so secure shell comes in versions one and two. Uh, we'll use version two when we do our lab for the latest and greatest features. So on your desktop PC, you can use, we have TerraTerm, we also have PuTTY. Um, PuTTY is probably the most uh, famous secure shell client. You'll turn on your, you'll install the PuTTY on your desktop PC, Windows, Linux, whatever you have. And then you'll start the program. And uh, in this particular case, uh, secure shell is uh, enabled on switch one. It has an IP address that's already been set. And on our, uh, uh, on our terminal emulator, like Telnet or Putty, we're going to point to that particular IP address, and it'll ask us for our name and our password. And the very first time you connect, he's going to pop up a screen that says, do you accept the public-private key pair exchange business? So they can communicate securely with each other. After that, he won't, he won't get it anymore. Oops, did that work? So we can type the command show IPSSH, and that tells us this device is running version 2.0. And then we can run show SSH, and that'll tell us any people that are currently connected to our device. Our Cisco switches generally can uh, uh, have about 15 to 16 simultaneous users logged in at one time. Okay, we're going to do this in the real world here. Now let's look at routers. Routers and switches are so similar. They use the same iOS. Cisco did a wise thing by making the iOS command set pretty much the same for all their devices. So once you learn one iOS, you can configure any Cisco device you'll ever run into in the future. So uh, initial configuration is very similar. So for example, on a router, uh, when I first attached to a router, I'll plug in, I'll run TerraTerm from my desktop PC. I'll plug in the blue cable to the console port of the router. And when the router first comes up, he has no configuration. His initial default host name is router. I'll type the command configure terminal and go into the global configuration mode and say host name R1. 
to give that a, a name. And notice that instantly, as soon as I type toast name R1, the prompt changed to the router name. Instead of default router, it's R1. Uh, enable secret class is our encrypted password that we should use instead of enable password class. Then to be able to allow people to come in through the console port and require a password, I type the command line console zero and set the password to Cisco. And then to allow people to come in through Telnet or Secure Shell, I'll type line VTY04 and set the password to Cisco. That last line, service password encryption, will, instead of the passwords appearing in the clear when you do the show run command or show start command, it'll kind of change them to some, some encrypted dot look so people can't look over your shoulder and learn, learn what the password is. We used to use this uh, banner message of the day. It used to be a thing we would use to put out happy messages like, uh, oh, I took a C course. It wasn't C plus. I think it was C minus. This is a long time ago at UTA. And uh, they gave us access to their uh, uh, digital equipment corporation, their deck mainframe. <clears throat> and they would put up a message that says, the system will be undergoing maintenance Sunday from 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. Have a nice day. But the hackers kept breaking into systems. And the hackers got hauled into court. And the judge uh, and the judge, defense attorney for the hacker said, but your honor, it says welcome. And the judge says, okay, you hackers, you go free. Because uh, he said welcome. So now we have to put nasty grams instead. We put messages like oh, authorized users only. Everything is being tracked. If you disagree, you leave now. So whatever your company lawyer at your place of business tells you to say, you will put banner message of the day. In this case, authorized users only. And that appears before they ever even try to log in. And then the command at the bottom, copy run start, will save the current configuration from RAM to the NVRAM for it to be saved. <clears throat> okay, so switches and routers use um, uh, the interfaces they use. A layer two switch is a local area network connection. They only show one host machine attached to each switch here, but normally these are 24 or 48 port switches. They'll have, they'll have several dozen employ, employed desktop PCs attached to them. Routers typically connect to another floor or another building or another site in another location, and they will go through a leased telephone data line or through a fiber optic line to another building like we do at the South Campus. So uh, uh, in this case, dual stack, that means we're running both IP version 4, like 192.168.10, and we're also running IP version 6, 2001, DB8. So IP version 6 has been around for about 20 years now. And, and most companies have adopted both the old uh, legacy IP version 4 and the newer IP version 6 switches. And eventually the, the idea is get rid of all the legacy IP version 4 stuff and to IP version 6. So do you have a cell phone? You're running IP version 6 when you talk to the phone company. They're not using that old legacy technology. They're using new technology. So to use our router interface, I need to do the no shutdown command to bring it up and up because all router ports are down by default. And I need to configure it with an IP address, either an IP version 4 address or an IP version 6 address or maybe both, dual stack. As an option, you can add a description on that interface. You might say this is the port that goes to the AT&T least link that gives us a connection to the other campuses. Don't have to do that, but in programming class, they teach you it's impossible to overcome it, your code. You, it's a good practice to put a description so that when the next guy works on it, uh, he can have some idea of what's going on here. Or even after you've slept since then, maybe you'll remember what you did there. So in this case, uh, the Gigabit Ethernet 000 has been configured with an IP version 4 and IP version 6 address. They've added a description that, oh, this is a link that goes to LAN 1. The IP uh, second gigabit port 001 is, is, the, is the link to the LAN 2 devices at that company. So uh, at our business building at South Campus, LAN 1 might be the downstairs computer science department, and LAN 2 might be the marketing and accounting department that's upstairs. And then the serial port is the port that goes to the least telephone data line that ties us back to the Trinity River Campus. And they all have both IP version 4 and IP 6 addresses, and with all have been typed no shutdown to make sure they turn on. 
Do you, uh, have you ever had the occasion to go to your desktop PC and try to test it by uh, typing ping 127.0.0.1? 127.0.0.1. That's a special loopback port present in your Windows PC. It's actually present in all desktop PCs, not just Windows, but Linux, uh, Mac OS X. That's a way of just testing to make sure that the TCP IP code is properly installed and it's working. While routers can also use loopback ports, and they're commonly used if we want some, well, for example, when we should look at the OSPF protocol in the next eight weeks, uh, uh, some versions of OSPF use a loopback port to identify an identity for that OSPF routing protocol. It's also a trick that if you only have one interface you want to ping and you want to bring up a second interface, you can create a, uh, just like in your desktop PC when you ping 127.0.0.1, that's not a real another device. So you can create a loopback port on a router and create a, an additional address if you want to ping. That's in test to see if it's pingable from everywhere else in your network. The weird thing about loopback interfaces is that they're born no shutdown. In other words, they're not, they're administratively up and up. They're not administratively shut down by default. So if I say interface loopback one and apply an IP address, he comes up and up. I don't have to type no shutdown. If I want to, I can shut it down and bring it back up again. But they come up without the no shutdown command being necessary. Nothing confusing about that. Okay, we're gonna do, we're not gonna do this lab, we're gonna do the switch lab. Okay, some show commands that we can use to check operation of an interface. Show IP interface brief, we saw that before with the switch. Show IPv6 interface brief, the exact same command syntax on a switch as well as a router. It'll show us all of the uh, uh, interfaces on the device, whether they're up and up, what IP addresses have been assigned to them. Uh, show running config interface is a shorthand that'll, you know, show running configuration, you get three or four pages of junk. You got to press the space bar and try to jump down to the line you're interested in. Well, you can zoom right to the interface section. You can type show running config interface and it'll jump right to the interfaces. Uh, routers have routing tables because that's how they determine it when they, uh, routers are layer devices when they receive an IP, uh, IP packet. A layer three packet, they look on their routing table to determine whether they should forward it. Switches are layer two data link devices. When they receive an Ethernet frame, they look on their MAC address table to decide whether where they should forward that Ethernet frame. So routers are more sophisticated, they live at layer three. So a router's routing table, show IP route will show us IP before routing table, and you can see all the networks he knows about. Either they're directly connected to him with the letter C or they're learned about from another router, like when we look at OSPF later on, it'll have a letter O in front of it. So show, in this frame, show IP interface brief for R1 shows that it has, uh, the two gigabit ports are up and up. They have IP addresses assigned to them. They're up and up, they're not administratively down. Uh, the fir uh, first serial port that goes back to the home office, it's up and up. Look at serial port zero slash one slash one. It's administratively down by default. He has no IP address assigned to it. It's unassigned. No one's using that on this particular router. It's a spare serial port. It could be used in the future. Then when we type show IPv6 interface brief, we see the corresponding report, but showing IPv6 addresses instead of IPv4 addresses. So dual stack operation. So show IPv6 interface brief shows us the uh, configured IP addresses. The global unicast address, that's similar to on a, on a router, you're probably 192.168.1.1. Uh, IPv6 global unicast addresses start with a number two or three, and those are the addresses that are routed over the internet. The link local addresses are just used within our local network only. They start with Fs. So if it's FE80 or FF, those are used for functions within the network itself. We don't want to send that. That's kind of like a broadcast. We don't want to send that into the... Uh, rest of the world and, and, and use up extra traffic. Oh, in IP version four, we have actually have broadcasts. In IP version six, they decided that we wanted to feel better about it. So there's uh, uh, the politically correct answer is there's no such thing as a broadcast in IP version six. So instead, uh, I'll just say, well, how does he determine the MAC address of his neighbor? He's got to broadcast that to all the other guys. They just don't call it a broadcast anymore. So it's smoke and mirrors. Okay, I want to check the configuration. So show running config. In this case, you type show running config interface gig 000. And instead of seeing all three or four pages, it jumped right to the interface gigabit. And you can see that right in the running configuration. 
So show interfaces shows shows uh, all the errors, like all the uh, uh, runs and 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 collisions and so forth. And show IP interface and show IPv6 interface shows all of that on the router. Now let's look at our route information. Show IP route shows us all the routes this, this uh, router knows about. It's all locally connected routes. We didn't have any connection to another device yet. Show IPv6 shows all the routes, but with their IPv6 addresses instead of their IPv4 addresses. So with the IP, void, IP version 4 world, we have our slash numbers, which is a shorthand way of indicating the subnet mask. So for example, the most common subnet mask in the world is 255.255.255.0. And in this case, that's a slash 24. You can see that in that first line C for the routing table entry at the top of the screen of that show IP route chart. A slash 32 is an individual uh, device's address. Uh, IP version 6 is almost always slash 64s for networks and slash 128 for an individual device. So the C indicates that's a directly connected route. If it was learned via OSPF, for example, the letter O would appear in the left-hand column instead of C and L. If it was EIGRP, it would be the letter D. If it was RIP, it would be R. If it was BGP, it would be B. That tells us how the router learned the routes. He learned it by gossiping with his neighbors. And he learned about, he knows about his own directly connected routes just fine. He needs to be given a little help to learn about how the other route routes are. There is a filter feature. Um, normally when you type a command like show run, you get three or four pages. And if you press the enter key, you get one line at a time. If you press the space bar, you get a whole screen at a time. The little more symbol, a more line appears at the bottom when you run out of space. Um, you can filter the output and you can do like we did before. We did show run interfaces and it jumped to that part. You can show and include and exclude stuff in that. Or you can just keep hitting the space bar until you get where you want to. Okay, the command history feature is very useful because you can press the up arrow key and repeat a previous command. Let's say you try a ping and then you'll try to ping again. Instead of typing the whole command out, you can just touch the up arrow key and it'll repeat it. You can use terminal history to increase this. Most of these commands we're not, people don't bother with. Okay, let's see now. I think I'm about done here. Hang loose, let me do this. And let me drop back to sharing this. We're going to share. I want to share an application. And where did it go? Oh, I made a mess. I'm going to bring it up again. OK, so I covered the Ethernet switch fundamentals uh, in the introduction fundamentals course. It takes two, 200 slides, so you got off easy. Uh, we looked at the iOS configuration commands. And when we come to our laboratory on Thursday, um, I'm going to fire up the real machines in the lab and we'll go over this again when we do the lab. I think I'm sort of step through the lab with you first on the overhead projector screen. And then you can guys do the lab yourself and, and turn, in, turn in your lab report. Um, Again, on Thursday, if you have any problems, I know you guys are logged in at TCC because you're here, hearing this presentation. You have to know your password to do that. Uh, if anybody has any problems logging onto the Networking Academy, um, uh, when you come to class on Thursday, uh, 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 tell me about it, and I will get you punched in there. I might have to key in a seat code, but I'll get you going on the Networking Academy stuff. Um, I will have the Network and Academy site chapter exams turned on, or module exams in this turned on soon. Uh, uh, but uh, we're not ready to do that first module exam yet because we haven't covered all the chapters. It's not separate chapter exams like it used to be. It's individual modules for like three or four chapters in a row. <clears throat> okay, let's see now. I'm going to carry on again. And so, okay, I'm pretty much, uh, let me check for attendance, make sure anybody else didn't pop in here. Okay, uh, well, that's one for the books. And I'm going to uh, end the session now. 
and please report Thursday uh, to the lab and we'll get going with the real machine, get, there, get, our, get our cotton picking hands on the goodies. Thanks for coming today and I'll see you guys soon.